So I think the, for tabletop gaming is quite interesting because the business of tabletop ga- gaming and the playing of tabletop gaming are two very distinct things. True. And uh, it is a is a conversation I've had with many game store owners and many game tabletop game business owners, which is the more time you spend in the tabletop industry, the less time you spend playing games. I finally cornered the other brother that makes up Parable Games. Barney has a great origin story, starting with being a competitive Magic the Gathering player, moving to a convention card seller, then to a game store owner and now a game publisher. The challenges and advantages of working with your brother, we cover those. We also discover the surprising origins of their new game, Don't Play This Game. Don't Play This Game is another expansion of what is possible in solo role playing. It challenges what the term game means. Can a solo RPG be a legacy world building horror narrative you pass on to your friends so they can play in the world you just created? Is there such a thing as multiplayer solo gaming? The answer to all of those questions is yes. Okay, sit back, relax, and enjoy my time with Barney. I'm Stu Goff. When I'm not exploring and creating new worlds, I like to listen to Tabletop Talk. Howdy, friends. Craig here. Today, my guest is Barney Menzies of Parable Games, the creators of one of my favorite games out there, as you may know, the Shiver RPG. Barney is the business manager, marketing engine, and the technical writer for the company. Now, Barney's brother, Charlie, was on episode 198 to talk about Shiver. Today, Barney's here to dive into Parable Games' newest creation, the horror solo RPG Don't Play This Game. Now, I use that description because it's going to give you an idea of what we're about to talk about. I don't think it captures what this game is, as, you, as you're going to see as we start to talk about it. Last but not least, you can look forward to Shiver coming to the channel for an actual play in 2024. Barney, welcome to the third floor. Thanks for having me. I feel like I've abused your brother to try to get you on the show. So it makes me <laughs> excited that uh, we somehow did the switcheroo and tricked you into coming on. <laughs> yeah, we had another podcast where uh, Charlie finished recording and I was moving some some stock around in his house and I just poked my head in at the end so that they could confirm that we are in fact two different people and that we're not just wearing different hats like (laughs) we figured out that he does have a brother not a mental illness right yes exactly (laughs) Uh, so Barty I I put your brother through this and I'm going to put you through this as well This is the standard question you get on every podcast, but I try to frame it a little bit differently. At one point, you knew nothing about role playing games and it was put in front of you for the first time. Can we go back to that moment? So, yes, my journey into gaming has been long and quite interesting. So um, I started gaming in uh, video gaming initially Um, and through video gaming, I then found tabletop gaming in Magic the Gathering which I started playing when I was a teenager. Uh, And that's also where I discovered things like local game stores and the fact that there was this whole tabletop world that I knew absolutely nothing about. Um, So I I dug into that a lot more in my university years. And when I was doing that, I was traveling around playing a lot of card games, started to get introduced to role-playing games there, had some friends that I played card games with that I played some sessions of Dungeons and Dragons with, and I was like, I really enjoyed this. Um, And then after university, I set up a company buying and selling used games. So I'd buy and sell cards, role-playing games, board games, miniatures, um, and that turned into a local game store, which I now run as my main project. Um, And then my sort of hard dive into role-playing games because after after that initial introduction i played a load of different role-playing games and on and off campaigns and one shots um but charlie came to me with the idea for shiver on a napkin at christmas one year uh and showed it to me and he's like oh yeah i've been playing this with my friends like what do you think i was like i could sell that in my shop we should make it um and we went through the process of doing that, and obviously that yeah. turned into Shiver and um, became a additional project for me that is now also a, a second business that I do. So I had to sort of have 
a really interesting relationship with games because Charlie came to RPGs from a purely passion side of oh, I'm, I'm doing RPGs because this is a thing that I've been doing with my friends. Whilst for me, the initial relationship with Shiver was, well, from my business experience in the games industry, this is a thing that I think we should make. Right. Um, and that's been a really good working relationship for us because obviously he gets to come to me with amazing creative ideas and I get to go, yes, that one's great. No, that one's awful. <laughs> <laughs> so question for you, because if I remember correctly, when we talked to Charlie, you know, Charlie was a little bit unique because he was relatively late in age compared to a lot of people when they first come across the, the role playing games. So am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, so I, he he was he was playing initially in his sort of early twenties at university, right. but we we started working on Shiver when in his mid twenties. So it's, yeah, not not like a teenage. Neither of us knew that. Like the closest thing that I think we both had in terms of contact with something that was even close to role playing games was the Steve Jackson uh, fighting fantasy style books, um, but nothing like actual table talk style. For you, it's unique because, I mean, obviously you found tabletop gaming, found it fascinating. And like many people were brought into the world via magic. But what's interesting to me is your transition from play to business. And I'd love to kind of go to that moment where you were a consumer and you realized I might want to to make this a a, a, a business. So what was that transition into the used games? So um, I got really into competitive Magic the Gathering, um, and that entailed doing a lot of traveling around Europe to various big tournaments. Uh, and as an impoverished university student, that was quite expensive. Um, and so one of the things that I did to fund my habit was buy and sell cards. And got it. Uh, I was getting towards the end of my university life, having done a history degree and not really knowing what I was going to do with said history degree. Um, I went to the careers office and I was just sort of chatting with the, the, the staff there and they're like, Oh, do you do anything else in your spare time? I was like, Oh yeah, well I do this thing with, with cards. And they're like, Oh, have you ever considered turning that into a business? And I was like, Oh, not really. Um, it's kind of just a hobby. Um, and then we have a discussion about it and they're like, oh yeah, you could, you could try, try something like that. Um, mm -hmm. so I decided to have an experiment where I went to an event, um, in Europe where I just went to buy and sell cards and I didn't go to play. Uh, and, uh, I made more money than I could have done if I won the <laughs> tournament. And so I was like, okay, this, there, there's something here. Um, and that then transitioned into me learning all about business and and going on that interesting journey because business and games are quite adjacent in a way in, in Very some much. of the thinking and, um, and process. So yeah, that was kind of how I fell into that. Um, as I've, and this is a, this is a classic problem that me and my brother both have is the, uh, the penchant to take a thing that we are passionate from and then make it our jobs and slowly like things just get sucked in. So for yeah. Charlie it was film initially and then it became games and and um every time we find a new thing that we like it kind of just like oh we'll just put that in the bag with the rest of the stuff and shake it up and see what comes out. Now something that's interesting and I and I think that's probably something different uh from you and me is that I have a iron wall between how I make money and how I hobby, right? And how I enjoy myself and my recreation. And it's a wall that I learned I had to keep up for my happiness because I explored trying to monetize and make a living at stuff that I love and realized that it made me not love it anymore. But that's obviously different for you. Is that just, has that never been an issue? Do you ever find yourself going, I hate tabletop gaming? Um, how do you, how do you reconcile that? Because I never could. So I think that for tabletop gaming, it's quite interesting because the business of tabletop ga gaming and the playing of tabletop gaming are two very distinct things. True. And uh, it is a, is a conversation I've had with many game store owners and many game tabletop game business owners, which is the more time you spend in the tabletop industry, the less time you spend playing games. Um, right. And so whenever I get a chance to play games, I really, really enjoy it. Um, <laughs> and that's, and that's kind of how I've kept that passion alive. But I do also have 
other hobbies that are like hardline no like i don't want to 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 monetize this thing that i'm doing right um, because yes having some things that are separate is good um but with parable games in particular because it's a creative enterprise all things that you're doing bleed into it anyway and there's not really any way to stop that because every time i go to the cinema i'm thinking about something every time i go out for a meal i'm thinking about something if i go to a new place i'm thinking about something and you can't you can't ever stop that process from a from a creative standpoint nor should you so a lot a lot of people that i talk to also barney are uh one man or one woman shows you and Charlie are unique because you're brothers uh, and you do this together. But each of you have, if, if people go back and listen to my interview with Charlie, you can hear about his lane, right? And we're learning about your lane now, Barney. There's got to be benefits to it, which I would think are pretty obvious, right? Two minds are better than one. You guys are looking at it from two different angles. There's things that you don't have to worry about because Charlie has it covered and vice versa. Uh, but there's got to be challenges, um, especially with him being your brother. Um, how often... Do those challenges arise and what are they? So it's interesting because from a challenge perspective, I think there aren't actually as many issues as if we were just two friends because you can be a lot more frank with each other. I can tell Charlie his idea is bad and <laughs> he will take that on the chin and be like, oh, no, no. no. We had this with the with the Shiver Gothic book, where right? he did did the like almost finished the book, and he showed it to me, and I was like, I think we should essentially relay out the whole thing, and he wow. was like, I don't want to do that, and then he did it, and then he came <laughs> back and was like, You were right, wow, I, like that was not like the kind of feedback that would have been easy to give in many other professional situations, sure. Um, so yeah, things like that are very easy. Um, also just like we kind of know how each other think and know where yeah. each other's like weaknesses are. So there's constantly because I'm the way I think and the way he thinks are very different. Um, and that's very helpful because I'm I'm a mu- on the much more analytical side and he's much more on the creative side. But then we do have like moments where we cross over where he'll look at something i've written and go this doesn't make sense or um i would write like this and then i look at something that he's written i'm like oh yeah no i think this character doesn't make sense or um this bit of the world needs a bit of something extra um and it kind of bounces off each other and that's really really good um yeah i i i work i have a business partner in my my other business as well and i find that having multiple Having two people or three people on a on a on a problem is usually better because you get that diversity of opinion and thought. Um, but it it yeah, there obviously are situations where the more people you get, it does start to get a bit more complicated. Sure. Well, and you know, no matter what, you guys have the benefit of no matter what happens, you'll always be brothers, right? So it's not like you can quit that aspect of your relationship. That's always going to yeah, be the exactly. case. Exactly. Um. And so there's something you mentioned that I want to dig into just a little bit. Um, and I'm going to go backwards to do it. So my introduction to you guys was actually via the Gothic Kickstarter. So I missed you guys completely when you did the initial Shiver Kickstarter. I came across the Gothic Kickstarter. I saw the art right out of the bat. I'm like, I don't know what this is, but I need to find out because this is unbelievable. Um, and I've since become a huge fan of 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 him as an artist. He's just Got such a distinctive style. Um, I don't know if you are responsible for him putting the time lapse uh, stuff together or whether that was yes. just all him. Yeah, that's me. OK, so that's effing genius. And don't stop because I really, really enjoy those. And it's very revealing um, about his process. We actually changed the software that he draws in so that now everything he draws that isn't done traditionally is recorded immediately so we have everything oh. archived so that we can do stuff like that yeah that that's amazing content by the way so i back the gothic um i get a chance to talk to charlie um uh and really just get even more excited about the game because not like i said the art drew me in then i started reading about the mechanics which are very unique um, it's horror. So I'm an easy sell when it comes to that. I got my Kickstarter fulfillment. Um, and I was pretty blown away. I was blown away, uh, by the quality 
not only like do the books feel good and they look good, but I was really, especially considering how new you guys are, relatively speaking, the quality of the writing um, and the amount of thought that goes into the writing. And this is across the books. So that was a huge lead up to my question, which is, Charlie, I want to know what Charlie brought to you when he brought the initial layout of of the gothic book that you I can tell right now fixed because the the way the book is now is great. So what did he bring to you initially? Uh, So we actually started working on gothic at the same time as the Shiver core game or like just after once we had a playable version. Gothic was uh, the world that gothic is set in was our our playtest world for can we take Shiver and make it non one shot friendly? And how would we do right. that? Um, and so a lot of the characters and a lot of the world is actually the home game that we played with our <laughs> friends and original playtesters. No kidding. Um, yes. So he, he, yeah, essentially came with this gothic sandbox city and this idea for this big vampire opera story effectively um Mm -hmm. and then i brought in a lot of the well this is really cool but what are we gonna do with it from a broader ip perspective like what what how does this fit in with the rest of the stuff we're doing with shiver do you want spire home as a city to stand alone and then we never talk about it again or does it fit into a broader world and obviously charlie having written this um very interesting multinational vampire story was very keen to be like okay no we should plant this in a world and work out what's going on and that's kind of where finally my history degree came to use which was right well have i got news for you because we're about to plan out an entire alt history vampire timeline and work out what this alternate universe that we're doing is is like and what what things we're trying to talk about in that world Yeah, it's cool the way that you guys did this, because really, I think Gothic and these other supplement books that came along with that do something very unique, which is, you know, when we talk about Gothic horror, that's a style, right? Not a setting. Um, And you guys do a great job of capturing that. But with that, we also get a, a campaign setting. Um, And uh, on top of that, I also got a phenomenal campaign to run um, with within the city. So hats off to that. Do you guys have a sense because, well, I want to rewind for a second. So you talked about how do we make this not not one shot friendly, which is which I think is an interesting statement. So in some ways, did you guys initially see Shiver as being just a one shot game or were people telling you that and you wanted to break that? Like, talk to me about that statement a little bit. So the initial concept was uh, movie night on the tabletop. We wanted something fast and punchy that people who had never played a role-playing game before could pick up and play in an evening and that was the experience and so when we designed the core system you've got things like the doom clock and all of the fast mechanics that are designed to make it so that you can play those short stories but we found that once we got it into the world and started putting in front of play testers they were like but we want to play for years and we're yeah. like, ah, oh, so, okay, so yes, we have got to design it so that it can be short form, but also it does need this additional work to make it long form. And Shiver, do- as the core system, does work long form, but there were some things that we were like, we can definitely make this better yeah. from that perspective. And that's where things like the Doom calendar and the chapter-based Doom clocks come in. Um, just to give a little tweak to the system to make it friendly for that bigger, bigger story. Well, and and it would also, I think, it allows us to explore the character advancement, uh, which I think is one of the neater things in the system. And if you only play it as a one shot, I think you'd miss out on that. Yeah, definitely. That, that's that's one of the things that when Ch- Charlie did a really good job when he was writing the director's side of the core book talking about different play styles that players enjoy and he goes through 
uh, well, there's a load of different ways that people play role-playing games. Some people want to act, some people want to explore, and some people want to optimize and character yep. creation and character leveling. And also from a narrative perspective, taking that character from Dave with no powers, who is nothing but weak, to level 10 Dave, who punches zombies in the face, is really cool. Uh, and yep. that's, a, that's obviously an experience that people really get a buzz out of as part of role-playing. Yeah. And it, um, yeah, it, it's, um, I, I, what I think I'm going to end up doing with shiver is, uh, I think I'm going to, I've been writing a one shot, but one shot on our channel tends to be like six episodes. So they tend to be very long. Um, and, uh, but I think for my home game, I think I want to run the Gothic and I think I want to take this monster hunter journey in this incredible setting world that you guys have put together and uh, do that with my with my home game. So, guys, the Insider Insights series allows me to sit down with designers, developers, artists, writers and creators and learn how they approach their work. I try to understand their process, inspiration and the methods for crafting their creation. We're going to do that with Barney. and We're going to do it using a game that I have a lot of questions about. We're going to talk about don't play this game. We'll be right back. If you're an athlete, you know the greatest motivator of all is the fear of letting your teammates down. After all, a team is only as good as its weakest link. So you owe it to those wearing the same jersey as you to be your best every time you step on the field. That's why there's no vape in team. When you vape, you can expose your lungs to toxic chemicals that can damage your lungs. If you're a step behind, the team's a step behind. Brought to you by The Real Cost and the FDA. This is the part of many podcasts where someone comes on, interrupts the show, and explains that you should consider paying for the content that you're listening to right now for free. That pitch man explains by giving a dollar or more a month, you not only support the show, but you allow the show to grow and improve. Here on the third floor, we refuse to interrupt your episode of Tabletop Talk with such time-wasting pleas. We pledge never to run a spot asking you to go to patreon.com and give a dollar or more a month because supporting content creators keeps the content coming. Even if there is a link in the show's description, and there is, we don't ask you to click it and become a patron. We don't waste time rambling about the benefits like early access to episodes, getting episodes without ad breaks like this, or even getting a chance to play in one of Craig's RPG sessions. Anyway. Enjoy this episode knowing Tabletop Talk, despite being supported by its patrons, won't engage in such blatant appeals for support. So I, Barney and I have uh, been talking back and forth, um, I think from the very beginning when I first reached out with you guys and uh, I clamored to try to get you on. Not that I didn't want Charlie. I wanted both of you. So this ends up turning out to be a good thing. Then this don't play this game buzz starts. So um, in the first segment, I blew a little bit of smoke uh, your way. I'm going to do it again because there is a very obvious and deliberate marketing process that you guys are going through with this game. And I want to tell you that it's very effective. Um, you guys are doing a good job of helping us understand this game. And I would imagine it's important because it's a little bit different uh, as far as a game is concerned. I'm going to read a little bit of the blurb uh, off the Kickstarter, and then I, I really want to dig into this. So here's what it says on the Kickstarter. Don't play this game as a legacy solo tabletop role playing game about you being cursed to play the game with a mysterious capital E entity. When you begin playing, an event will happen. You will record it. What happened? How did that make you feel? What effect did it have on you? Sometimes words, sometimes photos, whatever the entity asks. Once an event is completed, the entity will select another one. This repeats and your story unfolds until you complete the game and you are free or you lose and horrible things happen. There's things in there that make sense to me, Barney, and there's things that don't make sense to me. 
So to kind of understand the game, I want to go backwards in time. So there was at some point the idea behind this or what became this didn't exist. And then the acorn dropped. Can we go back to what you consider to be like the initial seed? So we were driving to a convention in Scotland from where we're based in Ossian, which is about an eight hour drive. Um, and we're like, well, we've got eight hours in the car. What are we going to do? And so the answer was, let's design a game. So <laughs> we were thinking, we'd, and one of the things that we've been digging into is with Shiver, we've had interesting delving into sub genres of horror. And that's currently how right. we're exploring Shiver as, a, as an, a, a larger game. But we were very aware that there are some elements of horror that are very difficult to capture in a traditional role-playing game. So we were chatting about that and being like, okay, well, what are the things that we think would be really difficult to do with Shiver? Mm. And Charlie came up with like, well, what about like mixed media storytelling? And I was like, okay, interesting. So not like traditional role-playing. Um, and we'd obviously, pre prior to this, we've been talking a lot about solo role-playing because it's the big buzz at the moment loads of people really interesting it in solo games in general um yeah. and he then came out with do you remember when you used to get letters in the post and emails that said e you must send this to 10 people or bad things will happen to you etc i was like yes, yeah i do remember i do remember that early internet slash non-internet world um and he was like, well, what if we made something that was like that? And then we started talking about that. And it's like, well, well that's very much like, like films like The Ring and found footage. Yep. And, that's, and that is a very difficult medium to capture in a traditional role-playing game. So we're like, okay, well, how would you do that? And it's like, well, you could do a journaling game. And I was like, okay, yeah, well, that sounds weird. Um, and he's like, but then the problem with the journaling game is you don't get that like really gritty analog feel. Like you don't get to go out with your Polaroid camera and your like VHS recorder. And that's what I want to capture. And we started spinning that around and around and around to get to this point where it's like, well, we have ended up with this infectious game that is a solo role-playing game, but it's not just a journaling game it is a multimedia storytelling experience that incorporates journaling uh sketching photography videography audio recording whatever creative medium you want to tell the story within the bounds of the game so when i when i'm playing don't play this game Am I am I taking on a character because there's well, there's a lot of solo role playing games out there where i take on a character or am I playing myself? Does that make you sense? Can do, you can do either. Um, but oh, the, interesting. The, the, the first thing that I flagged when we were designing this is we have to have some very, very good safety tools for this game yes. because there is a strong chance that because we want it to be an incredibly immersive storytelling experience that people could really freak themselves out or if you have a tendency for things like um, uh, disassociation or something like that, you could start thinking that the world that you have created is real. If you, if you right. get scared enough in it. Sure. Um, and so that's where we were like, well, because initially we were like, you're playing as you, you are you. You're not playing as a character. And I was like, no, we should have the separation as a character and then the option for that character to you be, be you if you want it to be. Right. Much like in Shiva, we had the, you can use your own fears, but make sure to check with your players and character that that is going to be a good idea before you do it. The, the, the path of a traditional role-playing game goes in development is, is pretty standard, right? Which is you, you have some ideas, you show it to a few people that are, you know, that you trust, you kind of work out the big bugs, you make it playable, then you go through pay, play testing. But that's got to be very different for this type of game, um, not just only being a solo game. So what was the earliest version and what, what did that look like? And how did you guys begin to know that this was more than just a conversation from Scotland like this? This thing might happen. Do you have a sense of when when you feel like it started to mature? 
by the end of the drive when Charlie had written the demo in eight no hours. No kidding. Yeah. He was like, I want it to be structured. I want, so I want it to be, he was like, I want it to be, like, we got to a few hours in, we're like, okay, right. We've got this thing. It's a, it's a cursed book. Um, and we want it to be a fixed, uh, a multi-branching narrative. But what we're going to do is we're going to generate a min viable product for it, which is going to be a fixed 10 event story mm. that you play through. And that's going to be because mm-hmm. one of the things that we do when we're designing stuff that we think is going to go to Kickstarter is everything needs a demo version because that is the easiest way to convey what the what the, the full game will be like is here's a small version of it that you can have a look at um and that had gone very well with shiver and so we were like well we're just going to do that for this game as well and so charlie created this 10 a 10 event thing um and then we we played it through and we're like okay yeah this is cool and then start tweaking on mechanics um and working mm-hmm. out like how we're going to do health how we're going to do resources but the initial idea was if we write this as a base journaling game, what are the core elements? It's like, well, you need right. a character, you need to work out whether the character lives or dies, and you need to work out what's happening to the character. And then everything else after that is a bolt-on to make the game more immersive. So after the drive is done and you start moving into phase two of this, what were what were some of the big hurdles, things that maybe you didn't identify as a problem when you were driving and talking about it, but as you started getting your hands dirty, you realized that that this was a challenge and one that you solved. But I'd love to I'd love to get a sense of what some of the taller hills were. So multi-branch narrative is really hard because you have to create stuff that works with everything else. How, how so? And so? It's not the same as writing a linear story. So okay. just, uh, take a take for example the the Gothic campaign story or one of our one shots. They have a very clear defined Act One, Act Two, Act Three. Yep. Or in the Gothic campaign, they have ten chapters, and each of those chapters has an Act One, Act Two, and Act Three. So the narrative construction is really easy. Um, whilst for for this game, you do your first event, and then the entity selects your next event for you. Mm -hmm. And that could be anything from go to your local library to research the thing you saw in the mirror to uh, go and take a photo of an abandoned building that is calling to your character. And having those make sense in an order is very, very difficult unless you work out how to do it. And the way that we worked out how to do it is that it's a multi-branching narrative, but the the story always moves through stages, which are much like Shiver in like an archetypal idea, always the stages that you go through in a monster movie or a confrontation of like the the ramp up of the horror, the initial interaction with the thing that you're scared of, the pullback, the research phase, the maybe second interaction, and then prepare and then final confrontation and then over. And there are loads of variations and you can have loads of different uh, sort of multi-strand narratives where you're like going in and you're dipping, you have like a pump fake act two and then you're back to act one again and all of this kind of stuff. But knowing that initial structure makes it much easier to then decide, well, do I need a D4, a D6 or D8 to move from the first event I'm doing? And things like that, that are like just like really crunchy, like, Mm-hmm. I need to make the maths work so that the, what we're trying to do carries through. Um, so that was quite difficult. Um, the other thing that we had to work out was how we were structuring the events to give people the most amount of creative freedom whilst also having enough restriction to make it a, a, a non, not an impossible storytelling task. Because you want to be able to for people to insert themselves and their creativity into the story that they are making but they all there also needs to be enough bounds to the game that they are not just going out completely into the void and could could make anything it's an interesting sort of process to go through and and that is why the events ended up in a a tripartite design to give a bit more um scope for that creativity but also to give the event a very specific feel so that you have the idea of what is happening to your character and then you can create from that as games are developed 
one of the things that I hear all the time is that, you know, we had, you know, some of the initial hurdles, the phase we just talked about where, you know, we're, we're doing the, the blocking and tackling, right? Um, we're, we're, we're understanding what does this game look like? What does it feel like? And then I hear about the last thing, which you never know is going to be the last thing, but the last thing we added or the last thing we removed that made it all work. So I keep hearing that there's something that like we kept struggling with this. We kept this kept nagging us. And at the last minute, we just did this and it all came together. Did that happen with this game? Um, it was uh, I think for this, it was primarily the light bulb moment of the like in effectively the infection mechanic of the game where it's like you finish the game and then you give the thing that you've created to your friend, and then they have to play and then you realize that the the events that you've created take on a completely new meaning when you have a previous lexicon of created content from another person and as that loop goes round and round and round and round you generate entirely new threads and almost to the point where you're creating urban legends in in situ through the game oh that's incredible because it does lots of things it does it it makes solo gaming not solo but still is solo right yes and boy, it just nails the touchstones that you talked about. I mean, that's straight out of the VHS tape from the ring. Right. And that feeling of I've got to pass this along and and creating like, oh, that's really interesting, Barney, because that now suddenly my solo gaming has an audience yes. that is not just going to just consume and watch, but is going to participate. Yeah. So the the we already have like on our discord for the game people who are sharing the entities oh my God, that's that cool. are being created by their story and people creating stuff off of that. We have a like a, a GM that's done a lot of stuff with Shiver who's now started playing this, who has played the game through once and then has made another character who's inspired by the previous characters playing through again. And this just from the demo. And wow. this is just 10 fixed events. And so when it's way more than 10 fixed events and they're not fixed at all, then the the story combinations are pretty much limitless um and it's also from a from a from a player perspective you get a tangible thing at the end of playing mm. a character and the just seeing people's scrapbooks and journals or audio logs of the things that they've made full of polaroid pictures and sketches and things that they've made out of dirt and twigs is really, really cool. When, when your baby gets out there, right. When it's no longer you and Charlie kind of hammering this thing out, when you finally release it out into the world in its current form in this demo form, what has come back to you that surprised you? So there's aspects of what you just talked about on the discord, which I think you and Charlie probably anticipated, right. Where like, that's what this game is designed to do. This is the feelings that are supposed to be invoked. What, what came back to you that you didn't anticipate? What has already surprised you? So straight off the bat, the first thing that people ask for is we want a multiplayer mode. We want to be able to go out as like and properly Blair Witch it up, three people going out <laughs> into the woods. Like, yeah, how do we do that? And we're like, oh, we hadn't actually considered that that's the thing that people would want. But also from a safety tools perspective, it's really helpful. So because going out into the woods by yourself is not always the best <laughs> idea. And we do, we had already, already suggested that you should take a friend with you. So having rules for that friend is a really, really good idea. So, yeah. so that's the thing that we actually added as our most recent, it was like 300% funded stretch goal because it's going crazy at the moment, um, but was uh, expanded multiplayer rules because we're like, okay, well, we definitely put multiplayer rules in. And then it's like, okay, well, now let's expand those and go, right, well, how, how, do, how would we do a a drop-in session where maybe you're playing a course of a story and your friends come around for the weekend and you're halfway through the story and you want to play, but you want your friend to play too. How would you do that? Um, oh, and think, cool. things like that, that we could work into the game so that it doesn't just have to be a solo experience. It could also be a multiplayer experience beyond the way that it kind of is a multiplayer experience already. Uh, what were the other feedback? So one of the big pieces of feedback that we got is that we had massively underestimated the amount of people who were really keen on a journaling game that wasn't just writing. There are a lot of people that wanted to paint and draw and video and and that 
that was very exciting when we put it out and we're like, okay, this is exactly how we envisioned people playing it, which is, which is really cool. Um, it's also neat. I would imagine too, Barney, because in this day and age, um, and this is coming from an old guy, it's a lot easier to create in a multimedia environment now because of technology. So the barriers of creating video, the barriers of creating audio and stuff are, are gone. And one thing that we really wanted to do was have the game be a on-ramp for people who don't see themselves as creative to right. start creative, creating things. And that's why a lot of the art for the game and a lot of the things that created have been made by me and Charlie, who are not <laughs> artists. And right. so you can see these really like scratchy drawings and uh, all like shaky hand cam stuff. And it really ties into that found footage feel of this is horror and it's horror made by regular people. Oh, that's cool. It leans into the touchstones, which I just love. So now I want to talk about the business side of this just a little bit, if I could, Barney. So um, it, how many th is this the third Kickstarter for Parable Games? So this, this, this is the technically the fourth crowdfunding campaign because we okay. did a campaign for Shiver Double Feature on Game Found, oh, which I um, which I backed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's so right. We, God, I that's, that's, that, about is the, that. that is the one that everybody forgets that we did because we we wanted to get that out, and we ended up because uh, I was going on a bit of a sabbatical. We want we were like, well, either we can wait and people will have to wait for content, or we can crunch this and do two shiver kickstarters in a year. And we yeah. did that on Game Found, and also wanted to test another platform and things like that. Um, but yes, this is the fourth one that we've done. But most importantly, it's the first new game that we've launched right. after Shiver. What do you think you've learned now? So now as you've gone into this with far more experience than when you first did Shiver, when you did Gothic and when you did, up, did Double Feature, can I get a sense of what learnings you brought with you to this most recent one? Um so there's a lot of stuff that we learned from a sort of logistics and product design perspective about mm. what you can do from a complexity standpoint that is all right and what you can do from a complexity <laughs> standpoint that's going to make your life really, really hard. And For so example? we locked in all of the, okay, so we know how to make a book and do that. That's really easy. We know how to do dice now. Those are we've nailed those down. Um, we we know how to do accessories. We know how to get stuff from manufacturer to fulfillment center. Because um, initially for Shiver, we were only using the UK fulfillment center, which is my shop, yeah. and a US fulfillment center. And so then, as we've moved through that, it's like okay, well, let's add an EU fulfillment center. And then moving to us, okay, well, let's add a Canadian one. And for wow. don't play this game, we're adding an Australian one. And so it, we're not rushing so that the wheels don't fall off. So everything, yeah. we, every time we go to a new Kickstarter, we try and add a new thing so that we can, one, stretch ourselves creatively, but two, also stretch us from a business perspective to learn something new. Um, and that's where having done multiple campaigns and going, oh, well, I know that I need X months contingency for when this thing that will absolutely go wrong goes wrong. <laughs> so for this campaign, we're making handcrafted boxes full of artifacts, which are previous players' records that you can inherit and start a story from oh, Wow! part two, essentially, of, okay, I received this shoebox in the mail along with this game that says I have to play it and I'm going to carry on that story. But we're making those boxes ourselves. We're not outsourcing wow. that to China. We're recycling everything. We're trying to, like, I spend this morning at a car boot sale buying weird old things to put in boxes for people. Oh, that's and we're so going to cool. make some really creepy handcrafted boxes <laughs> because the other thing that we're trying to do is go, well, where is the design space in in role playing game? Like, what aren't people doing? And I was like, well, what we just what we just got some doll's heads and put them in a box and send them to people <laughs> with with a role playing game expansion. Doesn't get scarier than that. I hope you have it. You have your mental health insurance paid up. <laughs> oh, that's great. All right, so 
the next obvious thing that pops into my head, Barney, is time travel. Um, so the Barney today is far more seasoned in this process uh, than the Barney that uh, launched the Shiver Kickstarter X number of years ago. You get a chance now to go back to younger Barney and right before you're about to launch the Shiver, uh, first Shiver Kickstarter. What are a couple of things that you think you would uh, share with him to say, hey, uh, you're about to do this and you uh, you probably should know this because I have figured that out. So first thing I'll say is you can literally never have too much time to prepare a Kickstarter. Um, I bet. We, we were prepping and launching pretty much up to the wire of that one where like we hadn't even finished the Kickstarter page up until the point where it went live. And that the first experience of doing that Kickstarter was incredibly stressful, not only because it was I our like, first baby out into the world, but also we had no idea what we were doing. We didn't have like an asset list that we needed. We were just like, Hey, Charlie, I need a banner. Make me a banner. And then me going over here and writing some more copy. Like it's, it was absolute chaos. And so having, having an actual plan um, would have, been very helpful i think mm-hmm. also speaking to other creators um would have been really helpful to find some more pitfalls because i'd read every blog post available on the internet that i could find about crowdfunding and listen to as many podcasts but there is still so much information in the heads of people actually operating in the space that you you won't get in those because i mean as we've said, like you've only just managed to get me on the podcast and there are so many other people who are are in a similar state where they like, or maybe aren't even interested in coming onto a podcast and talking about the drudgeries of logistics and, and business management. Um, I think the, I I think those are the main things that I would, I would say most of my advice to like new creators is, Make sure you put the thing in front of people as fast as you can and make sure you make something and release it. Just finish something. That tends to be my big advice. Because we have a lot, I, I get a lot of people coming up to me at conventions now. And it's like, oh, I want to start doing stuff in the role playing game space. Like, how should I start? I was like, make something small, finish it, and release it. Because iteration and experience is worth much more than anything else. It's funny, Barney, that that has come up more than once as I've talked to people, which is you, you've got to start somewhere and you can get stuck not starting. Um, so that's advice that I've heard before. Um, obviously, the two of you sat down, uh, planned this out. Um, like I said, it's very obvious that the marketing campaign was laid out. Uh, the, the, the maturity of this Kickstarter shows and, and the way that you're doing that. Um, and, and that's as a, uh, obviously as a compliment. I'd be curious, though, because projections. Have you been surprised? Yes. So this we we were like, this will go one of two ways. Either <laughs> this because because we knew we knew it was something very unique, but we right. didn't know if it was good, unique or bad. because. <laughs> Because one of the things that we talked about when designing this, because we had big, me and Charlie had big arguments with Shiver about how scary we were going to make it. Because when we started Shiver, I was not a big horror movie guy. Like, I was a big horror comedy guy or like pulp movie guy. But like, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, hell no. (laughs) I have since come round to that. And I'm now like very deep into my horror movie education. Um, Beautiful. But, um, the discussion that we had with Shiver is oh, how scary are you going to make it? We landed yeah. on that like middle line of yes, it could be pulp, but yes, it could also be quite scary. But yeah. there is an element of humor and pulling away from like truly bleak and terrifying horror that we didn't want to go down that route completely. Mm-hmm. And with this game, the discussion was how scary can you make a role playing game? And then let's try and do it. And we were very aware that for everybody (laughs) right Um, right so that was one of my concerns obviously the actual concept for the game is very unique in that we're like right well how how open are people going to be to multimedia storytelling 
is that too far from where we've come from? I've rocked up and I've rolled a dwarf for D and D to I'm going out with a video camera in the woods and I'm calling this a game. Where is the line on that? Um, so those are all like some concerns that we had going in. Um, we were pretty happy with like the actual style and concept because analog horror in particular seems to be really gelling with a huge portion of people, much like we were very confident with gothic horror as a, as a, as a genre, that this was a thing that people really wanted. Yeah. Um, but it's, it, yeah, it's going very, very well is how I would currently describe it. And I think potentially it might be our best one yet, but I'm not, I'm not willing to, to kind of make that commitment until it happens because that's how I am as a person. I don't tend to count my chickens until they have truly hatched. Um, Obviously, I talk to a lot of creators that are in a similar position, right, where they're doing a Kickstarter and they reach out uh, the same way you guys did. And, um, you know, when you guys shared some of the initial parts about the game, I went through a very similar thought process for you guys (laughs) as an outsider. I'm like, this is either going to be a really big deal or it's going to just barely get funded. And I was very pleased when I checked this morning to see this uh, situation. And so for those of you listening, this is coming out. Uh, we're recording this a couple of days before uh, when it actually comes out. And uh, it um, I had not looked at the Kickstarter since I had backed it. And uh, I was uh, really it really made me happy because to your point, there is a possibility that someone will read this and I'm sure this has happened, right? Cause not everybody has funded it uh, and backed it, but where they go, yeah, it's a little too much for me. Um, but what you don't know is how many people go, Oh hell yeah, I'm going to jump into this. And a, a similar uh, game uh, uh, to this in that same feel was um, Shep Shepperson's uh, rectify, which is also a solo game that uh, he's been on the show. Listeners have heard that interview with Shep and Shep is he's not doing what you guys did. But the one thing that's similar between this and Rectify is that you guys are doing something that hasn't been done before, not only in solo role playing, but I think in role playing in, in, in particular. And you guys are stretching what a game is and kind of redefining what games are. And you you never know. Um, but uh, it. um It's really, it makes me happy that there's enough people out there that are willing to take this journey with you. I I think the other thing, thinking about it as well, that I was slightly concerned about was I had this kind of light bulb moment about how we were going to market the game halfway through the design process. Because originally we were like toying around with like, um, like, I can't even remember what the working name of the game was. And I was like, there's just not something right about this. And then I had this idea that I wanted to do a negative marketing campaign (laughs) in a vein of like, steal this album or like, don't read this book, like things that have been done in like punks, punk style, like um, marketing for products before. And I was like, that could work really well. But then I was like, if we call it Don't Play This Game, will people just look at it and go, all right, (laughs) I won't. (laughs) That's not how our brains work. There's a reason that punk marketing works. But but, but, tabletop gamers do like to be like, feel really, really smart. And we do get a lot of comments on ads that are like, okay, I won't. And it's like, (laughs) oh, it's just ruining my beautiful marketing baby. Um, but it's also like the things like I want to write this. I want to write the marketing copy in first person because I'm a I'm a sicko and I hate creative writing. I'm going to make it really hard for myself. And we're going to have Charlie create terrifying things because Charlie doesn't exist. That's why I'm doing this podcast, by the way. The entity has actually stolen him. Um, <laughs> and he's we in told an Charlie not to play this game. Yeah, and he's in an <laughs> abandoned warehouse right now making TikToks. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. As far as I'm concerned, Barney, um, I don't know if you have made a game that will have any level of success if you don't have some smart ass from his basement 
putting a smart ass comment on some somewhere somewhere. So that that's a badge of honor. It tells you're on the right track. It means that people care. Um, so obviously everybody knows the routine. They can scroll down. We've got links to the Kickstarter. Uh, and you can you can really get a sense of what the hell we're talking about here. But I'm really happy we've had a chance to have this conversation because it's it's clarified some things for me. And I think it's it 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 really helps me understand um, just just how unique this is. A uh, couple other things I want to talk about before we wrap up, though, Barney. One, I want to talk about your um, Patreon um, because I, I think it's really cool what you guys are doing with that Patreon. So can we talk about what the idea behind the Patreon is and and what uh, you know, what you guys are doing there. Cause I, I really, really think it's unique. Yeah. So we, we launched the Shiva Patreon as uh, a vehicle for a few things, but primarily what we wanted to do was have a way for people to access new Shiva content without us having to release a huge book and have to do a Kickstarter and make it a sustainable way for people to interact with the game. Um, but also we wanted a place where we could stretch our creative muscles a bit without the worry of having to have these huge book-based shipping overheads because I can just make a cool digital version of something and release it. Um, and so we ended up structuring it in a way where we would releasing stuff every month, which is a pretty standard Patreon model. But then we decided to do the tiers in quite a fun way. So the core offering at five pounds a month was a shiver adventure. But the interesting thing that we did with the shiver adventures was it's a shiver adventure for something that we've not made yet. It's shiver, mm -hmm. but it's not shiver Gothic. It's shiver cryptids or shiver slasher before we'd made slasher. And we wanted to show much like we did with the curse library in the uh, first Kickstarter was have things that showed people the breadth of story that you could tell with the system. Then we moved to the second second tier, and we're like, well, we're writing these quite not prescriptive stories for the for the for the base for the base tier. But what could we do as an alternative? And we'd done some case file. We'd call them case files for the first Kickstarter, which were narrative to an extent but they were much more a piece of world building which provided resources and tools as a like here's a crib sheet for you to make a campaign from and what that then let us do was like ah well what if we created this really weird town near spire home and we put things in it that people could play with and then we released that and then let people go wild with it and that, that kind of lets do that, which is fun from a design space perspective. And then the top tier, well, all right, how much suffering do we want to inflict upon ourselves as game designers? And the answer is, let's design a new game every month. Wouldn't that be a good idea? Um, and that has been a wild process. Um, I but bet. has been very fun from a... We basically we keep going to trade shows and seeing all of these amazing stores that have loads of fabulous creative work from people in the zine space and the OSR space who are making booklets and pamphlets and leaflets and staple bound things and whatever whatever print media thing that you could possibly conceive of and turning it into role playing games. It's like, well, we want to do that, but it's really hard to do it as well as Kickstarters, so we need to fit it in in a business way that makes sense. And that was a Patreon tier that means now we have to make stuff every month, which has been very fun. And I mean, some of the things on there are games that I've written that are like yep. just me and then Charlie's edited it. And some of the things are, uh, so we've got one coming out later this year that is the first actual game that Adam, who's one of the new like writers in the team has written um and we've got yeah games that are just an a4 piece of paper that are designed to slot into dungeons and dragons sessions that we wouldn't have made if we were just doing shiver content yeah. so it's, it's it's a real fun process i bet and, and it gives you um obviously it it you know forces you uh to do things which creatively can be 
incredible, right? Because it, it it can push you into places that you may not have explored before. Um, and uh, just, you know, the, that whole case file concept, I've really been enjoying that. Um, and w- as somebody who, again, is consuming this information, it's just these beautiful seeds. It's these beautiful ideas that if I don't use it as written, it inspires me to think about Shiver differently than I did before I got my hands on it. So uh, I'm a huge fan. Uh, Barney, there is a lot of things to do on a Sunday afternoon, like go to a warehouse and make TikToks after you've been consumed by a solo role playing game. But somehow you made time <laughs> to sit down with me and I really appreciate that. No, it's been great. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Lovely to chat games with people. And for those of you listening, this is the end. You made it. And I appreciate you listening. Take care. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Subscribe to Tabletop Talk and share it with your friends. Check out our content on YouTube and Twitch. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook and stay updated on everything coming from Third Floor. All the links are in the show notes. Take care, floorheads. Dude, you got to be on more podcasts. You're good at this. I did them a lot when I was playing a lot of Magic, and oh, did you? <laughs> after I did that, when I was playing a lot of Magic, and then I played a lot of the Lord of the Rings Middle Earth like strategy battle game, the miniatures yep. game, and I did a lot of podcasts for that as well. So, oh, you, are you talking about the Games Workshop one? Yes, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I played on the England best team game. for that, and yeah, it's amazing. Best did you really? Ever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Best game they ever put out. Best game, yeah. hands down, the best mini game uh, they put out. Not my favorite minis game, but the best that Games Workshop has ever designed. Yes. Did you know that that was originally based on a Western game that they had put out yes, like I have 15 years game. before? I have a warband of Mexicans that I have played that <laughs> game with. Yeah, well, so I because cool. we, we're in Nottingham, I have so many Games Workshop friends, and one of my friends has collects the Warhammer historical publication, so he has all of it. Um, so we play wow. like weird old war games that he collects oh, that's um, cool very fun. that's yeah. cool have you guys uh, have you uh someone who likes miniature games have you looked at uh weird games yet and oh. malifo uh so i've looked at malifo a little bit but i've not played it um i'm like a pretty big on weird war game stuff so like our artist at the moment is playing Turnip 28, which he loves. Um, nice. But I was talking to my friend about Trench Crusade as well, which is also popping off at the moment because um, we're both big into like the big grim dark art stuff. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, Malfoy's a really good game. Um, uh, it's good competitively. You should check it out just because I think the mechanical aspects of it, I think you'd find very interesting. It's got some got some innovations in it, but that's not what we're here to talk about. I'm going to bring us back. Um. (laughs) Uh, Oh, hey, are you still here? Wow. Um, well, the episode is over, but if you're bored, why not go to patreon.com and support the show for as little as a dollar a month? Yeah, you can just scroll down, scroll down and yeah, get the link. It's Patreon that makes this and all of our other content possible. Don't you want to join the other floor heads on the Patreon discord? Anyway, thanks for sticking around. Take care. Bye.